Hi, I'm John Colton from Brigham Young University, and today I'll be talking about exton binding energies and um, focusing on the two-dimensional metal halide perovskite phenethyl, phenethyl ammonium lead iodide. Uh, I'd like to thank my cl uh, collaborators, Cameron Hansen and Emma McClure, uh, especially, who will be giving the next two talks in the session, uh, along with Louisa Whitaker Brooks uh, from University of Utah, and also our funding agencies. Uh, as an overview, our goal here is to develop a method to precisely determine the exciton binding energy for metal halide perovskites. We're focusing on two-dimensional materials where the layers of the lead and halide atoms form uh, octahedral, uh, octahedra um, quantum wells, uh, and the binding energy is uh, significantly larger than in three-dimensional uh, materials. But we hope that the uh, lessons that we learn from two-dimensional materials can inform people that are working with three-dimensional materials. As already mentioned, uh, the uh, material I'm presenting is uh, phenethyl ammonium lead iodide, or PEPI for short. And my colleague Cameron Hansen will be talking about a few other materials that we've studied using this technique. The technique itself is electroabsorption. Um, and as you will see, it can give accurate measurements of band gap and exciton energies and binding energy uh, being the difference between the two, and also some other information. Uh, this work has been uh, published or is accepted for publication in uh, PRX Energy. We hope it will be on their website any day now. And it's available, uh, an earlier draft is available on archive. I'll include this information again at the end of the talk. The um, samples are grown on interdigitated electrodes. Uh, spin coating uh, forms polycrystalline material. Uh, we use approximately 100 nanometers of thickness, and the interdigitated electrodes um, provide electric fields uh, parallel to the plane of the surface. And that's also the direction that the um, octahedral planes stack. Electroabsorption is a subset of absorption. So uh, here's what the absorption looks like. The black is our experimental absorption. The red is calculated from the two-dimensional model that I will describe in a minute. And uh, you can see there's two main features. There's the peak here that is the exciton, and there is the step-like function, which is the band gap. And if you could very precisely measure the onset of this step um, in the black curve, that would tell you uh, where the band gap is. And then you could take the difference between, between that and the exciton energy to get the binding energy. But knowing exactly where that onset is, um, is a little bit tricky for these materials. Um, zooming in now on the exciton feature, um, it's actually comprised of three peaks, which are well known and understood to be from phonon coupling in the lead iodide layer. Uh, the width is approximately 11 milli electron volts, which we attribute to homogeneous broadening, and I'll refer to that again in a minute. Uh, Electroabsorption is um, basically you just apply a voltage to get the absorption with the field and then subtract off the uh, absorption without a field. We do that um, modulation using a lock and amplifier, and we reference it to uh, the voltage on off frequency that we apply. And the um, black curve here is uh, what you get with no field, just a cartoon. And when you apply a field, typically the exciton peak shifts via the quadratic Stark effect, and the band to band absorption um, generates oscillations, which are well known as uh, French. Franz Kaldish oscillations. When you subtract the two, you get something that looks sort of like this. Now the theory we've um, stolen from three, five quantum wells, uh, a 2D one year exciton in the electric field has a Schrodinger equation that looks like this. Uh, there are three terms to the Hamiltonian here, the in-plane kinetic energy, the Coulomb attraction between electron and hole, R is the separation distance between the electron and the hole, and then the uh, energy from the uh, field. And I've written this in terms of dimensionless units. Once you solve this equation for the wave function, you um, plug in R equals zero to get the uh, overlap between elect electron and hole. And this formula gives you the absorption. Um, when you solve this with F set equal to zero, uh, this has an analytic, analytic solution and it gives you delta functions for the exciton resonance, and then this step function for the uh, band gap um, dependence. 
However, when f is not equal to zero, in order to get the red curve here, um, it's a much more tricky problem to solve. And we've adapted the technique of, uh, adopted the technique of Dow and Redfield, uh, which basically involves doing a coordinate transformation uh, in terms of parabolic coordinates, dividing the wave function into a product of two functions, one of which is this chi one function here. Um, then you can uh, solve the equations for each of those two functions uh, to get chi one and chi two. And this is not related to the um, chi one susceptibility. Uh, but you get chi one, and then you can um, uh, calculate the absorption according to this equation here. We've also then convoluted both of these absorptions with a Lorentzian having width of that um, um, gamma mentioned earlier. And here are some of our electroabsorption results. The absorption here is on the top. It's just what I showed you before, but with the top, the exciton cut off because it's not too interesting. And then the electroabsorption is shown, shown below the experiment on the left and the theory on the right. And you can see at first glance, there's this little discrepancy right here. Um, but this feature we ignore because it comes from the second absorption peak where we're concerned about the um, initial absorption. And one of the most important things that we've uh, learned from here is that um, the model predicts that the um, zero crossing over here is the band gap energy. And so the feature over here, um, if we just look in the middle where it crosses zero, we can say, oh, that's the band gap. And therefore the binding energy is the separation between this excitonic peak and that um, zero crossing. And when we calculate the binding energy of that method, uh, we get very consistent results from sample to sample, about 222, 223 milli-electron volts. Uh, focusing now on this region, um, what we also see is that it broadens when the um, field is increased. The peak D on the left shifts further to the left, and the peak F on the right shifts further to the right. Um, I'll come back to that broadening. And we also see that the amplitude of all these features increases. But tellingly, the amplitude of the exton feature here has a squared dependence on the field, um, which is what you expect for the quadratic Stark shift, whereas the amplitude of this other feature has um, a sublinear dependence. Um, and so the broadening of this feature combined with the sublinear dependence on field combined with our model, which um, predicts that the uh, band gap should occur right in the middle of that oscillation, um, all um, fit together to give us a, a very accurate measurement of the band gap energy. If we look at the difference between the gap, the band gap and the exciton peak, uh, we find that the binding energy stays pretty constant with field in this material. And uh, it again varies about uh, between 20, 223 and 222 mil electron volts. If you look at the shape of the temperature dependence, as temperature increases, it broadens both the absorption and the electroabsorption. And the electroabsorption actually changes shape a little bit from a first derivative type line shape more to a second derivative type line shape. Uh, a first derivative shape is what you'd expect if you have a peak that then shifts a little bit in energy when the field is applied, and then you subtract the two. Um, so that is uh, expected for the quadratic Stark effect. And if you look at uh, that derivative shape, that's what I've plotted here. So that on the left is the EA signal, on the right is the derivative, and there's a pretty good match between the two. The first derivative, um, again, is a uh, part of the quadratic Stark effect. And if you look at that um, Stark effect, it allows you to obtain a value for the Bohr, uh, the Bohr radius. Um, in our case, Although we're using a two-dimensional theory, uh, we actually expect it to be a little bit between the two-dimensional case and the three-dimensional case because the, the quantum well region has some width to it. Um, but we can use those as limiting cases and say um, that the actual case should be between the two. And that gives us a value of the Bohr radius of about 2.2 nanometers. Um, we also can get the polarizability from the quadratic Stark effect. Um, and it has a value of 80,000 in units of angstroms cubed. But wait, there's more. As mentioned, uh, this, the line shape shifts from first derivative to include some second derivative. And even at low temperatures here, there is some second derivative character to it. 
and we can fit the second derivative um, to the uh, linear Stark effect, uh, which depends on the dipole moment to get a value for the dipole moment. Uh, meanwhile, over here uh, in these oscillations, I mentioned the broadening before. Turns out the broadening scales as field to the two thirds. I've just plot separations between various um, features uh, versus field. And that broadening depends on the reduced effective mass. So we can get a value for that of 0.09. So in conclusion, uh, we have um, used electroabsorption combined with the theory of two dimensional Wani excitons to get results um, for PEPI, uh, for binding energy, uh, bore radius, um, the uh, polarizability, the transition dipole moment, effective mass, and also the Rydberg constant, which I have not discussed. So I thank you for your attention.